Last week, we're in week two of Limitless, and last week we talked about limitless what? Worship. Now, now I'm depressed because only four of you remember. It was powerful. I think, I think after reflecting on it and, and hearing the testimonies that come in, it might have been one of the most important messages that I've preached since I've been here. If you missed it, if you missed it, you really need to go back to newlifecanton.com and listen to the podcast or watch the video cast. Limitless worship. It's a foundation. It's life changing. When we really understand what worship is all about, it's not three songs on Sunday morning. It's a lifestyle consecrated. It's a life given, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is our acceptable act of worship. The good, the bad, and the ugly, all given out to God. Limitless worship. I'm not ever, listen, hey, I'm not ever going to be satisfied with the sprinkler experience anymore. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. I want the waterfall. I want the waterfall. I want the direct flow from his presence in my life. I'm not going to be satisfied for the residual blessing. I want the full deal in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm not going to preach that message again. I wish I could. It was good. One second, Marianne. Let me get in the middle of this. I want to begin today by reading our theme scripture for the series, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able, everybody say able. Oh, that was pitiful. Say able. able. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works where? In us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We discovered last week that Paul's focus on this was not verse 20. 20. It wasn't the exceedingly abundantly above. That's the one we get excited about. That's the one we quote all the time. It was actually verse 21. To him be glory. The key is worship. The key is giving God the glory to his name. And Paul was preaching and he was assuming some faith. To him who is able, we have to believe that he is able. And so what we found out was that our faith and our worship are linked. How many want greater faith? Come on, how many want to see God move and have the faith to see God move? About half of us. Come on, how many? If you want your faith to rise, your worship's going to have to rise with it. Or first. So as we redefine worship, that's what we did last week, we, we begin to live this redefined worship out in our life. We begin to lay everything in that altar. We begin to consecrate our lives to him. And as our faith begins to rise and stir within us, then what happens? What happens next? Is that it? I think next comes vision. I want to talk today about limitless vision. Vision. I would hope that every one of us in here would want our lives to count. Just me? Does anybody want your life to count for something? Come on. Does anybody want the devil to be nervous that you got up in the morning? <laughs> oh, Lord, here he comes. We all want to make a difference. I've told this story before, so if you've heard it, I'm sorry. I love it. I'm going to tell it probably more, more times. If you're new, then it'll be new to you. There's a little, there's a young boy about 10 years old. He's walking on the beach. And hundreds, if not thousands, of starfish have, have washed up on the beach and, and they're they're stranded there. And without in the sun coming down, they're gonna die. Well, he's walking along and he's 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 picking up these starfish and he's tossing, randomly tossing them back in the water to save them. Coming the other direction, walking is an older gentleman, and he's walking along, and the boy's watching, walking toward him from a distance. He's watching this take place. And so as they get closer, and then they get face-to-face, -face, and the boy's just been randomly stooping down, he's not making a dent. You understand that, right? There's thousands of starfish. He's not making a dent. And he gets up there. The, the older man says, son, what are you doing? Why are you even bothering? You're not making a difference. There's no way you can really make a difference. 
The boy just grins, looks up. He bends down and grabs a starfish. He goes, made a difference to that one. (laughs) We can make a huge impact in our circle that God has put us. And we all want to do that. But listen, look at the screen. If we want our lives to count, we must have a vision for life and take action to see it fulfilled. It's not enough to just have the vision. We have to take action to see it fulfilled. This morning, we're going to talk about personal vision. Not your mama's. Not your grandma's. Not your best friend, your vision from God for your life. And then tonight, in Next Level, I'm going to talk about the corporate or church vision. But listen to me. A collective or corporate vision isn't nearly as powerful without a people of vision to go with it. Pastor, is this really necessary? Are you just being dramatic? What's the purpose of us each having our own vision. Look at the screen. Limitless vision provides focus to your faith. Limitless vision provides focus to your faith. It gives you something to aim at. It gives you something to work toward. It gives you something to pray about. It gives you something to rally around. It gives you something to hope for in a world that is hopeless. Hope is powerful, powerful. It also does something else that is very personal and very powerful. Listen closely. Look at the screen. Limitless vision gives pain a purpose. Next, next slide. Can I have the next slide there? There we go. Limitless vision gives pain a purpose. If you don't have a vision, listen carefully. If you don't have a vision for your life, you're going to spend your whole life taking the path of least resistance. You're going to try to avoid every problem, every issue, every difficult person, and everything that's uncomfortable. But vision will direct you through the obstacle instead of around it. And then the the pain and the problem and the issue and the tragedy and the crisis, suddenly those things become purposeful and begin to mold your character so that you can attain a vision for your life that is unshakable. And it begins to change your life and mold your life and focus your life. It provides purpose for your pain, a life of Meaning. Goodness gracious, folks. People, Christians, believers are going through their life just floating along. Everybody look at me. That is not God's will. For us to just exist until Jesus comes? Or until you die and go to heaven? Jesus died that we might have life and have life more abundantly while we are here. And the only way to do that is to have a purpose and a vision and a calling on our life and to fulfill it, to see it happen, a life of meaning. Vision has been defined hundreds of ways by many great leaders, and I'm not saying that any of them are wrong, but for our purpose today, I want to think about it this way. Look at the screen. Vision is a mental picture of what could be And, everybody say and. And. Everybody say and. And what should be. What could be and what should be. Limitless vision is not a pipe dream. Limitless vision is not just a preferred future about what could be. Vision without a should be will lack the motivation and the focus you need to see it out. A vision without the should be won't be important enough to you to actually put time and effort into it. A vision without the should be will not capture your heart, and soon you will lose interest. You will not follow through. You won't put your shoulder behind it, and eventually it will be gone. It will fade away. If you can't add the should be, to your could be, then your vision is limited. And we don't want limited. We're not going to put up with limited anymore. We want the full deal from our Father. We want limitless vision. One of the best scriptures we have in the Bible for vision is Proverbs 29, 18. 
It says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. The King James says, without a vision, people what? Perish. They cast off restraint. I want to talk about Samson for a minute. He was born with more potential than any other human being before him. His birth was prophesied almost like Jesus, was almost in a messianic fashion. He was bigger, he was stronger, he was smarter than anyone else. His future was bright and his potential was enormous. But he ended up in prison with his eyes gouged out, with absolutely no vision. Stripped of all his dignity, his anointing gone. A slave to his own undoing. The proverb says, without vision, the people cast off restraint. How many teachers or subs or people that work with kids in the house? Raise your hand. You guys know that if you're going to have children in a room, a bunch of kids together in a room for an hour, you better have a vision for that hour. You better have a plan in place for that hour. You better have something for them to put their hand to for that hour, or you're going to have a mess, you're going to have chaos, you're going to have unrestraint. Well, that's the way Samson was living his life, without restraint, completely unfocused, undisciplined. His potential was never really fully realized because he had no vision. He had no focus for his life. Look at the screen. Limitless vision is more powerful than potential. Let that just settle for a second. That one's, that one's kind of deep. Limitless vision is more powerful than potential. Come on. Give me a man or woman with vision any day over talent, any day of the week. Give me a teenager who has a plan of action for their life and a vision for their life over talent any day in the woods. Come on. Vision is more powerful than potential. You may not be the smartest or the most gifted person in the room, but if my God gives you a vision from his heart, then he will equip you, he will anoint you, and he will use you to fulfill that vision. He who began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of Jesus. He is faithful. He is faithful. Samson had all the potential in the world no vision. So what can we learn from his story? What happened? What was the tipping point? I think it was when he fell in love and married a Philistine woman, not Delilah, that was much later, later Timnah. When he met and wanted to marry this, Phil Philistines were the enemy. <laughs> He wasn't even supposed to be hanging out with, with these folks. He was being raised up to judge these folks. His parents tried to talk him out of it, but they caved. They gave in, and so they had this huge wedding banquet. And the weddings in that culture weren't 30 minutes like they are here. It was all week long, and, man, there was, a, there was partying. There was a lot of drinking, there, you know, and, and, and he was acting like an idiot, and to make a long story short, people died. That'd put a damper on the celebration, wouldn't it? People died, and so he had to leave town for a while to let things settle down and leave his new wife. But soon he began to miss her because he really did love her. And he began to think, you know what, I need to go back and get my wife. And this is what happened, Judges 15.1. Later on, it was during the wheat harvest, Samson visited his bride, bringing a young goat. Ladies, ladies, isn't that exciting? He said, let me see my wife. Show me to her bedroom. One track mind. But her father wouldn't let him in. He said, I concluded that by now you hated her with a passion, so I gave her to your best man. But her little sister is even more beautiful. Why not take her? What a dad. What a great father. My goodness. 
crazy. Verse 3, you can't make that up. Verse 3, Samson said, that does it. That's it. This time, I'm, when I wreak havoc on the Philistines, I'm blameless. Something snapped. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? You've, you've probably had an experience like this. Something broke in Samson. For the next 20 years, Samson lived a life of unrestraint, unfocused, undisciplined. He casting off his calling, casting off his potential, trampling on the anointing of God on his life, living an unfocused, selfish life. Listen to me, everybody look at me. If the enemy cannot have your soul, like if you've given your life to Jesus and he can't have your soul, he wants to kill your vision. He wants to take you out of the game. He wants to disqualify you with sin. That's what was happening. That's what was playing out in Samson's life. And that's what can happen to us. As soon as we believe that we're bigger than that or we're, we're better than that, watch out. Pride comes before the fall. It opens the door to the enemy. Very quickly, I want to unpack the tactics that Satan used against Samson to derail his vision, to distract him, to keep him from his purpose because he hasn't changed his tactics. He hasn't changed them one bit. And if we can learn from that, then we can avoid the same pitfalls. Number one, a painful experience. A painful experience. Samson lost his wife. And then his unrestrained, unfocused, undisciplined behavior set his life on a trajectory of pain and depression and sin. Every person in this room has a story, from the youngest to the oldest. Now, the, the, the older we get, the more story we have, right? Sometimes that's a good thing. We learn. But every one of us, at some point or another, have been through some kind of tragic event, probably more than one, the older we are. Some kind of tragic experience. Everybody look at me. It's not... Isn't it bad? It's bad enough that we have to go through those things, but Satan wants to use them against you. He wants to use them against us. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was a death in the family, an accident. Perhaps a health diagnosis. Maybe it was some kind of abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse that happened in your life. Or maybe the loss of a job or a business that led to bankruptcy. Whatever it is, look at the screen. Don't make your current decisions based on your past disappointments. Don't make your current decisions based on your past disappointments. Listen to me. The enemy, the enemy wants you making your decisions for life based on fear. I'm not stepping out again. Look what happened the last time. I'm not doing that again. And then all of a sudden you live in this tiny little box and Satan has you right where he wants you. Yeah, maybe he lost your soul and you're going to heaven, but you're not going to be used in the kingdom because you're afraid that you, oh, I, I, no. I, and how can you have a vision like this? all bent over, looking at the ground and afraid to lift your head because your salvation draws nigh. Whatever doesn't get healed in your life threatens to kill your vision. Whatever you don't allow the Holy Spirit to heal, the enemy will use against you to kill your vision. That's why worship 
is so important because part of worship is allowing those things to come out and be, and be laid in the altar and exposed to God and letting him get a hold of them and begin healing them. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Samson never got over it. He never got over losing his wife. He never got over and he never got healing for the betrayal. And it, it ruined his vision. It ruined his vision. Number one is a painful experience. Number two is habitual sin or besetting sin. That's simply a sin that, that, that stumble, you stumble over, over, and over, and over again. You can't seem to get past it. You just can't seem to overcome it. With Samson, it was sexual sin. And a major problem with sexual sin. It, it talks about in his story, if you read it, him sleeping with prostitutes and having problems with women and all this stuff constantly. And that just opened the door to the enemy. Do you understand that? I was having a conversation with one of my daughters about, um, and she had some friends that had a Ouija board, and she, of course, mm -mm, no way. And she understands that opens the door. Those kind of things open the door. Well, so does sin. So does any kind of sin, especially those that are besetting and that we, we struggle with the most. Those open the door to the enemy. And Samson, the other thing was he was a hothead. He had a temper. And because of his power and anointing, people died all the time. Folks, there's some things. None of us are exempt from this, so don't sit there holy, holier than thou. There are some things that we need help with to overcome. Or else those things Satan's going to use against us to kill our vision, to take us out, to disqualify us. There's few things scarier than the concept of confession. Come on. But there's also few things more powerful. The word of God tells us, Paul tells us, confess your sins one to another. If you're failing and falling over the same sin over and over and over again, you need to be intentional about finding a trusted, mature believer and getting with not your best friend, because your best friend is a gossip. I be, nah, don't, do, don't do that. I do more harm than good. If you're sitting next to your best friend, just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> Come on. I'm serious. You need to be intentional about finding a mature believer in Jesus Christ who knows how to keep their mouth shut, who understands confidentiality, but who will be truthful with you and also operate with you in love, in a manner of love and grace and truth, and will hold you accountable. I promise you, if you'll do this, as soon as you do this, those things, that, that besetting sin will lose its power in your life. Why? Because the secret is out. And the secret is out, and that is what Satan uses the most, the secrecy of it, the shame of it. I'm preaching. Besetting sin, habitual sin is the second thing. Number three, immaturity. Oh, where's my soapbox? I'm going to get up on it. Uh, here we go. Here's one. We got to grow up. Y'all didn't react like I thought you would. Now listen, listen. Samson lived most of his life like a spoiled brat. Now, he had some great moments, amen. He was anointed. And fortunately, his greatest moment was his last moment. In one final act of humility and bravery, God redeemed his life because that's how gracious my God is. That's how powerful my God is. No matter what you've done or where you've been here, come on, my God can redeem your life, get it set back on the right track, and give you a fresh vision from him. Come on, somebody, give God praise.
As long as there is breath in your lungs, it's not too late. It's not too late. Somebody, I'm going to say it one more time because somebody, it's not too late. Maybe your son or daughter is not sitting here this morning and they are running as hard as they can from God. It's not too late. It's not too late. Maybe your grandson or granddaughter has forsaken their calling, has turned their back on God. It's not too late. My God is able. He's gracious. And in one act, he can redeem a life and give them vision. But for us to avoid these same pitfalls that Samson fell into, we need to grow in wisdom. To grow in wisdom, we need to grow in humility. And to grow in humility, we need to grow up. We need to mature. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Samson was the most anointed, strongest man on the planet, but he never got past and put his childish ways behind him, and it cost him everything, and it will be the same in our life. Look at the screen. This one's good. Your vision is based on the level that you live. (laughs) Your vision is based on the level that you live. Think think about it in terms of a high-rise building. Come on, the view, the vision is a whole lot better from the rooftop than the basement. But come on, you if, you if you wallow in your past and in your failures and in your pain and in your disappointments, you're going to stay in the basement and there is no vision down there. I'm not going to do it. Come on, my Bible says greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. My guys, if God be for us, who can be against us? I refuse. I refuse. I can't make you do it. I'm your pastor. I'm preaching to the truth to you. I can't make you do it, but I, me, Alan, I refuse to try to get vision from the basement. Come on, I want God to heal me. I want God to forgive me. I want God to set me free. I want God to raise me up. I want God to bring me to the next level and give me such a big vision. Come on, that only God can get the credit for it. Hallelujah. Woo. Man. Mm. If I was younger, I'd have taken a lap right there. My knees would have buckled and I would have hit the floor. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you sink that until I eat the carpet. Then it would be, we'll pick you up. You lift me up. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. He would be ugly, trust me. Listen, listen. The bottom line is limitless vision requires a mature outlook on life. Limitless vision requires a mature outlook. So... In closing, yes, I'm preaching a shorter message today. Don't say amen. <laughs> but listen, in closing, listen, how, how, Pastor, how do we get it? How do we get this thing? How do we get a could be, should be vision? Well, the churchy answer, pray about it. Just pray about it, brother. Now, don't get offended and mad. Don't just keep your emails to yourself. I, of course, of course, of course, we need to pray about it. But listen, God has created you and wired you and gifted you a certain way for a reason. We need to pay attention to what is already in our heart. Pay attention to what God has already put in your heart. Sometimes we just make this thing a little more difficult than it should be. Look at this. This may be the big idea. I didn't call it that, but this is huge. Limitless vision begins with a burden. Limitless vision begins with a burden. Pay attention to your heart. Pay attention to your gifts. Pay attention to your passions. Look at me. I promise you they will be linked to your vision. Because that's what God does. 
When you look around our community, what breaks your heart? What moves you? When you think about new life in the ministry of the kingdom, what part of that is most exciting to you? When you watch the news and see world events, what grips you and causes you to sit up in your seat? Students, listen to me a second. When you're walking down the the hallway and you're seeing the perversion, you're seeing the junk that takes place in your classrooms and in your schools, what's going through your head? I know that with Rachel, she just gets mad at it. She's my little prophet. She's like, ah! She doesn't do that because she's also she also has compassion. It's a weird it's a weird combination. She's playing it. She's not she's not here. So don't just just I can do this when she's not here. She she really does. It really bothers her. It really really bothers her. And I said, could it be possibly, Rachel, that God wants to use you to change the culture? And it's the same with us. Those things that we see that anger us or that may cause us to sit up and pay attention, those passions, God has put those there for a reason, and I promise it will be linked to the vision of your life. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. It's like. A vision begins with a burden. You won't have all the details. Stop fretting over it. You're not going to have the blueprint right away. It begins with a burden. You won't have all of the answers and all of the, 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 the blueprint of it right away. But when you have a burden, you have something to pray about then. You have something that begins to focus in your heart. Nehemiah is probably our greatest example of how vision can be birthed from burden. Let's look at that quickly. Nehemiah 1.1 1, 1 says, there, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn in the month of Kislev in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Zusa. This is Babylon. This is modern-day Iran. Now it's, now it's Persia. This is a long time since Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? Same place, different kingdom, different rulers, but you've got Nehemiah who is a Jew who loves the Lord. Verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some of the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things uh, were going in Jerusalem. Verse 3, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, listen, now he responds. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. What was his first response? Was it to pray? What was his first response? To weep. In fact, for days I mourned, and then I fasted, and then I prayed. Say that with me. I mourned, fasted, and prayed. Say it again. I mourned fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. That's what I call a burden. Folks, he didn't have a plan yet. He had a burden. He didn't have everything worked out yet. He had a burden. He didn't have a vision yet. He had a... And then he prayed about it. He fasted about it. He worked on it. He lamented about it. He wept and he prayed. And then God gave him a vision. Again, listen to me. I'm, I'm, I promise I am wrapping up now. Sure, Pastor. If your personal vision doesn't burden you enough that you are willing to hit your knees and push back your plate in fasting, then it's not important enough to follow through with. It's not a big enough vision. It's not a godly vision, and you need to put it to the side. final thought. If you are feeling a little bit conflicted right now, it's because we fight American Christianity. It might be because you're trying to do what God has asked you to do, but you haven't let go of what you want. And the two do not line up. And you don't have vision, 
you have die division. And division is the enemy of vision. Division will bring down nations. Division will destroy churches. Division will destroy your family and your life. I'm about to give you some big money advice right here. You ready? No? It's really, really deep, okay? Really deep. You have to put something down before you can pick something new up. <laughs> what? I'm going to say it again. You have to put something down before you pick something new up. Or else you're going to look like me trying to get from my car to the house when I'm too lazy and unwilling to try to make more than one trip, right? We, you know what that means. And then I drop everything and I'm mad and I have to ask for forgiveness because, you know, come on. Let's simplify things. Let's put some things down that are not of God. We know they're not of God. And let's pick up what he has for us. If we don't have a godly vision today, perhaps it's because we are unwilling to put our will down and put his will up. Amen. Now, I know. It's like I'm not sure I'm going to clap for that because then I have to try to do it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus himself was in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Lord, take this cup from me. Take this suffering. Take the cross. I don't want to do it. But not my will. Let your will be done. your heads in prayer.